Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today at the University of Michigan Center for Southeast Asian Studies. My name is Laura Rosick. I'm the director for the center here, and I have a few announcements before we begin today. Today's lecture is co-sponsored um, by the University of Michigan Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, the Department of Comparative Literature and Department of History, Romance Languages and Literature, University of Michigan Medieval and Early Modern modern studies and the International Institute. And as always, we thank our sponsors for your support and welcome here today. This is also supported by the US Department of Education National Resource Center grant um, that we have at our center. And before we begin our lecture today, I wanted to highlight another upcoming CIS lecture, Professor Yahaya, an assistant professor of history from the National University of Singapore We'll be talking about uprooting dias diasporatic histories of Southeast Asia. This will be on Friday, November 13th. And as of today, please feel free to register and join us. We've been so excited to have um, a large and um, very interesting audience at our seminars this semester with the availability on Zoom. And we are really excited today to welcome um, Ricardo Padron from the University of Virginia. Um, before we introduce him. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, Marlon James Salas is a lecturer and postdoctoral fellow in clinical translational studies at the Department of Comparative Literature here at the University of Michigan and is a research affiliate at the Center of Historiography of Linguistics at the University of Leuven in Belgium. He's a Hispanist researching the history of translation and multilingualism in the Philippines and the early modern literacies of the Trans-Pacific Spanish-speaking world. He's also a co-investigator in the University of Michigan seminar series, Sites of Translation in the Multilingual Midwest, which has received a Sawyer grant for comparative studies of cultures from the Mellon Foundation. And we're excited to have Marlon introduce our speaker for today and moderate the discussion after. As a housekeeping note, um, as you can see in your chat, the Q&A is enabled, but not the chat. And as you submit your questions, if you could please submit these with your name and your affiliation, um, we'd be happy to address those at the end of the seminar. So Marlon, please introduce our speaker. Hello, uh, Laura, and thank you so much for the introduction and for the amazing support uh, that you have given to this lecture today. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the first time in the history of the Friday lecture series of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies that we've invited a lecturer who doesn't teach in any Asian studies program, nor identifies himself as a scholar of Asia. Egotistically speaking, I have proposed that we invite Ricardo Padron to deliver this lecture today because his research in imperial cartographies in the Spanish-speaking world greatly informs my own research in the cultures of translation in the Spanish Philippines. I think there is a common struggle among Hispanists who are interested in Asia, some of whom are here with us today from all uh, different places in the world, to find a niche for our research for the reason that the Spanish Philippines has remained peripheral in the study of global Hispanisms and appears, if at all, as a mere footnote to a long history of Spanish colonialism that has largely focused on Latin America. Um, Ricardo Padron, is an associate professor of Spanish who studies the literature and culture of the early modern Hispanic world, particularly questions of empire, space, and cartography. His recently published monograph, The Indies of the Setting Sun, How Early Modern Spain Mapped the Far East as the Trans-Pacific West, published earlier this year by the University of Chicago, examines the role of Spanish writing about the Pacific and Asia and its ongoing conceptualization of the Indies as a geopolitical category. His research for this book has taken him to China, Japan, and the Philippines, and has been sponsored by the University of Virginia Center for Global Inquiry and Innovation, Arts and Sciences, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has also published on early modern poetry and historiography, and on the mapping of imaginary worlds in early modern times. Um, Professor Padron is an active member of the Renaissance Society of America and is currently serving as a member of its board of directors. He's currently serving as director of graduate studies in Spanish and as chair 
of the Arts and Sciences Committee on Budget and Development of the University of Virginia. So this opportunity to learn from a scholar from a different intellectual tradition, such as Professor Padron, adds richness to our understanding of Southeast Asia and its many entanglements with overlapping colonial processes that have shaped many uh, cultures and societies on both ends of the Pacific. I would like to think that this is also an invitation for us to re-examine what it means to do area studies and international studies in an age of interdisciplinarity in which we as scholars are challenged to explore alternative fa uh, framings for our research sites beyond the obvious and rather limiting geographical borderlines. We will have time, as Laura said, to take some questions and comments from our virtual audience at the end of Ricardo Padron's lecture today. So do write them down using the Q&A button that you have at the lower portion of your Zoom screen. Kindly note that this webinar is set up in such a way that only the speaker will be shown on screen and will be recorded in the video that the Southeast Asian uh, Study Center hopes to upload to the usual channels in due course. So without further ado, let's now listen to Professor Ricardo Padron. Yes, uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, uh, my name is Ricardo Padron, uh, and it's uh, very much a privilege to be here speaking at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. I want to thank uh, Marlon and Laura for their work in bringing me here and also all of the sponsoring organizations. Um, uh, as Marlon mentioned, I'm actually a uh, professor of Spanish. Uh, and I wrote this book, um, which I'm going to be talking about the book that Marlon mentioned, The Indies of the Setting Sun. I, uh, I wrote this uh, with Europeanists and Americanists in mind and thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to one day get an audience of Asian study scholars? So I was incredibly uh, honored and excited to have this opportunity. I'm looking forward to hearing people's reactions and questions. Um, so today I'm going to go through uh, more or less the argument of the book, tell you a little bit about where it came from and what it's about. Um, this book began while I was working on my first book. My first book was a contribution to something that we call transatlantic studies in my discipline. Uh, departments of Spanish are usually divided uh, quite clearly between those who specialize in peninsular Spain and those who specialize in Latin America. And during the 90s, uh, the boundary between these two subfields began to dissolve. I wrote a book that hoped to contribute to the dissolution of that boundary. And in the process, I was in the National Library in Madrid reading every 16th century text I could get my hands on that had a title like Description of the Indies or Description of the Americas. And the librarian brought me this book, The History of the Great and Mighty Kingdom of China by Juan Gonzalez de Mendoza, published in Rome in 1585 and then Madrid in 1586. And I was astonished, you know, I, I told her I wasn't there to read uh, descriptions of, of Asian locations. And she explained to me that in an appendix of sort, there's this very important, very influential description of New Mexico. So I looked at the New Mexico description, I took notes on it, but you know, the larger observation I made was, you know, why is it that in the late 16th century, it would occur to someone to put a description of New Mexico and a history of China in the covers of the same book. And at that moment, I realized that my attempt to think about a transatlantic Hispanic space um, fell short of the mark, that there was also a transpacific space that at that point wasn't entering into my understanding of the way that uh, Spanish speakers imagined their world and that that had to be the subject of my next book. I quickly found out that this book was rather well known. It was well known among people who uh, studied the European encounter with Asia, European print culture about Asia. Uh, it's actually the most popular European book about China from the 16th century, but it was completely unknown in my field, despite its tremendous popularity and influence. I also learned right away uh, the answer to my question about why these two apparently disparate places were pr produced were appearing in the same book. Uh, Gonzalez de Mendoza was an Augustinian friar who was designated as Spain's first ambassador to China. And the way he went to China was by crossing the Atlantic to Mexico. And then what he was supposed to do was he was supposed to cross the Pacific. By the time he made his trip, 
um, the Spaniards had established the first trans-Pacific commercial route operated by and for Europeans, the so-called Manila galleons that connected Acapulco to Manila uh, as of 1565 when the Spanish established their presence in the Philippines. And this Manila galleon route was being studied a lot or it has been studied a lot for the exchanges it facilitated between Spanish America um, and, and all different parts of Asia. It's, it's often talked about as an exchange of American silver for uh, Asian luxury goods, including uh, Chinese silk and Southeast Asian spices. So Mendoza was supposed to take the trip to Manila for whatever reason, he did not. He came back to, uh, to Europe without completing his mission and ended up writing this book about China. So I realized that there was this infrastructure there, an infrastructure that connected Spanish America to Asia and that, and that um, uh, and that facilitated the exchanges that I'd mentioned. And I realized that there was scholarship going on about these exchanges, the exchanges facilitated by the Manila Galleon. But what I didn't see anyone working on was what was the imaginary that supported and sustained and was in turn nourished by this, um, this, this spatial practice of trans-Pacific travel. And so I started to dip in to, um, uh, literature, uh, Spanish writing about the Pacific and Asia, and found that there was just an absolute wealth of materials, uh, manuscript materials, print materials, uh, maps, books, um, uh, materials in Portuguese and in Spanish, uh, just absolutely all sorts of things. And I don't pretend my book to be an exhaustive survey of these materials. It's rather a selective treatment of certain sources in an attempt to understand the way that the Pacific and uh, East Asia, and I say East Asia to mean both East and Southeast Asia together. You'll see, uh, you'll see quite clearly that both regions are, are at issue. Uh, uh, so the different ways in which Spaniards managed to uh, uh, imagine these as connected places. So in order to go through this argument, I'm going to, I've divided my talk into three parts. The first part um, involves primarily maps as does the second part. And it is a discussion of uh, the geographical ideas and the geographical evidence at the heart of the book. Uh, the third part will get into one of the actual texts that we've talked about so that you'll see that the book isn't just about maps, it's also very much about writing. So let me, let me get into this first part, Uninventing America. Um, I know that I have colleagues from Hispanic studies uh, in the audience, uh, and they may be very well familiar with this book and with the title that I've put to it, The Invention of America. The map that you're looking at is a 1507 map of the world uh, created by the German cosmographer uh, uh, Martin Baltzmuller. And it is famous for being the first document of any kind to call the new world America. It is owned by the Library of Congress and it's been advertised as America's birth certificate. But what is going on here in this act of naming is also an act of conceptualization. Um, what Waltzmuller suggested and Waltzmuller's collaborators suggested was that the new world was actually a continent separate from Asia that enjoyed the same status as the traditional three parts of the world, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So this is the, the it's considered a foundational document, not just in the naming of, of America, but in what, what, we, what we call a, 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 um, a modern global conception of the world that thinks in terms of these continents and that designates America as one of them. The problem with this argument, so in 1507, Waltzmuller supposedly invents America, and much of the historiography on this issue is dedicated to how this idea gets accepted and how the map of America gets sort of filled out and perfected. The problem, however, you'll see this inset map that helps us visualize the relationship between Waltzmuller's America, the continent of Asia, the island in between the two is Sipangu, Mar Marco Polo's version of Japan. Um, the, um, the idea became popular. We see this here in a 1524 map by Peter Oppian that was one of the first printed maps to really circulate Waltzmuller's idea. Uh, but the problem with the idea is that not everyone accepted it, not even Waltzmuller himself. For reasons that we don't entirely understand, uh, about nine years later, Waltzmuller produced the second world map, which is also in the collection 
of the Library of Congress. It's very different in style and content. We don't have time to get into that. The salient characteristic is the treatment of what we call North America. You'll see here um, uh, the Florida Peninsula and, and the Gulf of Mexico and the designation of what we would call North America as Terra de Cuba, Asia Partis, the land of Cuba, part of Asia. So what happens? Waltzmuller, after inventing America, after saying that America is a continent entirely separate, separate from Asia, goes back on the idea and reattaches America to Asia in such a way that what we call North America really becomes an extension of uh, the Asian continent. And in this case, the islands of the Caribbean um, get sort of confused with islands of East and Southeast Asia. There's a lot of debate about whether the island of Hispaniola is actually Marco Polo's Sipangu. Now, this is the crucial point. We might think of this as a minority um, uh, sort of slip back into more kind of traditional ideas, uh, ideas that are trying to hold on to a tripartite world. The problem is that the idea expressed in the second of the two Waldseemuller maps actually becomes the dominant one during most of the 16th century. So during most of the 16th century, if we look at the evidence from maps and globes, we'll see that Europeans are conceptualizing North America as part of Asia. So we have here a detail from a beautiful, very detailed map at Harvard, um, which is a 1558 copy of a 1545 original. And I just want to point out some details. Down here at the bottom, you'll see the word Temishtitan. This is the name that was used to designate Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec empire in modern Mexico. Uh, but right nearby, not more than 10 degrees of longitude to the west, we find uh, Cafe uh, and Mangi, the two names that Marco Polo uses to designate the two principal areas of China. And so Hispania Nova, New Spain, the name that the Spaniards gave to their Mexican colony, is actually a part of Asia Magna. And it is actually possible to walk, theoretically, from Mexico City to Beijing. Much of Spanish exploration in what we call the Southwestern United States is motivated by this idea that you can get to the lands described by Marco Polo by marching overland from Northwestern Mexico. Now, what is at stake in, that, in this idea? I wanna make the point that all of these debates about geography are not just about, about physical geography, but about human geography and about basic ideas of anthropology. Um, here's another map advancing another version of this idea. You'll see this one is from 1572, and it depicts a land bridge connecting North America to Asia. And this version of the idea makes it clear what is at stake, because this map is published as an appendix to a massive edition of the Bible published in Antwerp in 1572. Um, and it tries to answer the question, how did the native inhabitants of the new world get to where they were after the great flood? So in other words, according to Christian theology and according to sacred history, the world was repopulated after the flood by the sons of Noah. Uh, this means that everyone in the world is descended from one of those sons. It also means that in order for people to be where they are, there had to have been a root uh, by which primitive migrations could have brought Noah's sons and their descendants to the various parts of the world where they could be found. And according to Christian theology, this necessitated a land bridge. So what's the problem? We have two competing ideas about geography. The idea of American insularity introduced by Waldseemuller in 1507, which eventually becomes the dominant idea. The map on the lower left is from 15. Uh, 70, and it's, and it's thought to have really popularized that theory. On the other hand, we have the idea of Amerasian continuity represented by the two maps on the right. And what we can see is that for those who are giving a lot of thought to the whole, to the, to the systematic place, the place of the new world in larger systems of thought, the idea of Amer Amer American insularity threatens in a very fundamental way, uh, some central myths of European culture, myths that have to do with the unity of the human race and the possibility of its salvation. So this is not just about 
geography. Um, it's also about theology. It's about ideology. It's about anthropology. It's about a number of other things besides. Now, up to this point, there's nothing in my argument that is terribly new. There have been other scholars who have pointed out that we have a historiographical tradition that emphasizes the invention of America and that tends to marginalize and ignore this other tradition that resists the, uh, the invention of America and that finds other ways of mapping global geography, oftentimes for the reasons I've just mentioned. Um, but I think what we need to do is we need to dig a little deeper to find out what is going on here. We need a little uh, need to dig a little deeper so that we can actually learn how to read these texts and learn how they are actually imagining different forms of connectivity and separation. Up to now, the assumption in my talk has been that the only kind of connection that matters is a physical connection between the continents. When you have that physical connection, you have certain intellectual possibilities. When you don't have that, um, connection, there are other possibilities or it has other implications. What I'd like to do is I'd like to step back from this established conversation and talk about something else, not America, but the Indies, las Indias en Español. So what do we mean by this word? Um, one of my rather, the discovery that most astonished me in uh, making, uh, in doing this book was a search that I did in this database called the Corpus del Nuevo Diccionario Histórico del Español, the Corpus of the New Historical Dictionary of Spanish, created by the Royal Spanish Academy to support the purposes of historical lexicography. Now, when we look for occurrences of the word America in this database that contains all sorts of Spanish language texts, and we put our parameters as the years 1500 to 1600, we find only 55 occurrences in 13 documents, only 55 in thousands of possible um, uh, documents. Those uh, occurrences also are very interesting. What, uh, some of them are from uh, the text by Oppian. You remember I showed you that map of the world that popularizes Waldseemuller's ideas. Uh, that, uh, that's from a cosmography uh, created in the Low Countries, published in Latin, then translated into other languages. Um, many of the occurrences of America in Spanish are from the Spanish translation of that book. The other one by Las Casas is more interesting. Bartolomé de Las Casas was a friar, an activist and a historian very much involved in the Spanish encounter with the new world. And in his history of the Indies, he, uh, he, he explains to the Spanish language reader that America is what foreigners call the Indies and that you will see this word on maps imported from outside of Spain. So we have this very influential intellectual telling us that America is a foreign concept and a foreign word, that the concept that is native to Hispanic uh, culture is the Indies. So when we look for Las Indias in the same corpus over the same century, we find that it occurs 6,602 times in 691 documents. So, uh, you know, this is an entirely different scale of magnitude in the terms of the use of these terms. And so when we ask ourselves, what is the language that Spanish speakers, what is the conceptual vocabulary that Spanish speakers are using to think the new world? It is not the concept of America created by Waldseemuller, but this other concept called the Indies. Well, what do we mean by that? Um, another key point in the development of my argument was my encounter with a book called um, The Tropics of Empire, Why Columbus Sailed South to the Indies by Nicolás Gué Gómez. This is the most important book about Columbus of the last half century. And one of the things uh, that my colleague and friend Nico does in this book is he recovers um, for early modern uh, intellectual history, the importance of climate theory to late medieval and early modern thought. This is, uh, climate theory can be understood as a very different way of mapping the world, a very different metageography from the system of the continents. This is a system that doesn't emphasize the division of the world into land masses, but rather emphasizes the division of the globe into climatic zones, two frigid ones at the pole, a, a torrid one along the equator and two temperate ones at the temperate latitudes. 
this theory goes along with ideas about um, what, make hum what makes human beings tick, you know, how the environment influences human character. According to the ancients, um, the, uh, only the temperate zones were actually inhabitable. The torrid zone and the frigid zones were uninhabitable because of their extreme temperatures and extreme climatic conditions. What was happening though in the 15th and the 16th centuries, as Europeans encountered Sub-Saharan Africa, South, uh, uh, South America, the Indian Ocean Basin, they were coming to realize that the ancients had been wrong about the torrid zone, that the torrid zone was not only inhabitable, but actually inhabited. But what they did was they applied to the torrid zone the sort of ideas that came with climate theory about the effect of hot climates on human beings. And it was thought that the people of the torrid zone, like the people of extreme climates close to the frigid zone, were basically not fully reasonable human beings that were not capable of governing themselves. So in other words, uh, hot climates made for a form of savagery or barbarity. It made for an inherently servile people that were in effect available for European colonization, not only in, available for it, but actually in need of the civilizing influence of Europe. So what did my encounter with Nico's book lead me to? It led me to the recognition that we have to think in the early modern period, um, about the concept of metageographical diversity. So uh, let's review this idea, metageography. I take it from Martin Lewis and Karen Wiggin, The Myth of the Continents, a book from the late 1990s. They tell us that every global consideration of human affairs de deploys a metageography, whether acknowledged or not. By metageography, we mean the set of spatial structures through which people order their knowledge of the world the often unconscious frameworks that organize studies of history, sociology, anthropology, economics, political science, or even natural history. Now, the point that Lewis and Wigan make, make in their book, they're really talking about the modern world and they devote a chapter to the system of the continents, another chapter to the idea of the Orient, a chapter to the idea of Africa. If they, if they were writing the book today, I'm sure there would be a chapter on the distinction between global North and global South. So these sort of like basic, uh, structural frameworks that we often take for granted whenever it is we're doing what we're doing or talking what we're talking about. So the point that I took from Lewis and Wigan is that in the modern world, we have several of these frameworks and we switch from one to the other, sometimes very unconsciously depending on the context. Well, the um, early modern period had various metageographical frameworks as well. One was the architecture of the continents and another was the theory of climates. And one of the things that is so interesting and so complicated about this period is that both were in flux. The architecture of the continents was being remade from a tripartite system, Europe, Africa, Asia, to a quadripartite system, Europe, Africa, Asia, America. At the same time, as we just saw, the theory of climates was being remade because the torrid zone, the uninhabitable torrid zone of the ancients was becoming the deeply populous, the very populous area that we know as the tropics. So we have two frameworks, both of which are changing at the same time. So when we approach any kind, any piece of early modern cartographic literature, we have to look at the, at these, we have to learn to read it in terms of this diversity. So what we're looking at now is a 1525 map of the world made by a Portuguese cos, uh, uh, cosmographer who worked for the Spanish crown. The map has been made in the wake of the Magellan expedition. Magellan had been sent out to consolidate um, uh, Spain's claim to the Moluccas, or what was known then as the Spice Islands. Now, why did they need to do this? Because uh, some of you may recall that in 1494, Spain and Portugal had signed a treaty, the Treaty of Tordesillas, dividing the world between them. They drew a line through the Atlantic and everything east of that line was supposed to be Portuguese, everything west was supposed to be Castilian. But in a period where one could not measure longitude, there was a lot of debate over the location of these lines. Um, and I could show you Portuguese maps that make put the lines very differently. So what this map does is it puts the original line down the center of the map 
converting the edges of the map into the location of the other line, or rather the other half of the full meridian that circles the globe. And what we see there in the far left of the Castilian hemisphere, which is now outlined in red, are the Moluccas and China. Notice how close they are to the Portuguese border, close enough for the Portuguese to contest this mapping and say, no, the line is really elsewhere. Those are Portuguese territories. So this is why Magellan is sent out because he has to consolidate that claim by establishing a Spanish presence and creating a route to the Moluccas. So in some sense, in some sense, when Spaniards talk about the Indies, what they are talking about is that half of the world that belongs to Castile according to this treaty, right? So it's, it's really a, a, a purely political concept. On the other hand, when people talk about the Indies, as I just said, as I just explained, they're really talking about all the lands that lie within the old torrid zone. They're talking about the tropics. And so when uh, Iberians distinguish between the East Indies and the West Indies, we shouldn't think that the East Indies and the West Indies are fundamentally different. In other words, it's not like saying America and Asia. Because even though the East and, and, and West Indies might be divided between a Castilian West and a Portuguese East, they are both Indies. They are both tropical, suggesting that everyone in these areas will be fundamentally similar. That people from the Philippines or from the Moluccas will not be very different from Brazilians, who will not be very different from Guineans or people in the south of the Indian Peninsula. Then the third possibility, and this is the most um, unlikely in a Spanish context, and I, but I need to recognize that there exists, is that there are some Spanish intellectuals for whom the invention of America has taken place and the Indies are nothing more and nothing less than what we would call the Americas. So the Indies means different things at different times. It's a metageographical concept, but it's an inherently elastic one and, in a, and a multivalent one that can accommodate different possibilities. So notice that in this concept of, in the, um, the concept of the Indies, which I gave you first, the one in which it is just the Castilian half of the globe, and I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit too far back with my slides, we'll get there in just a moment. In this concept of the Indies, it doesn't matter whether America is part of Asia or not, because both belong to Castile. In this uh, concept of the Indies, it doesn't matter whether uh, America is part of Asia or not, because the tropical parts of Asia and the tropical parts of America are going to be similar. And that similarity is gonna be much more important than any possible difference between Asians and Americans. So we have this very flexible concept that is being invented and reinvented throughout the 16th century, but it's also an extremely durable concept. So we go ahead another 20 years, and here's a printed map of the world based on Spanish sources. This is the map that my editors decided to put on the cover of my book, and you'll see how it represents this part of the world. Uh, Spanish maps tend to be agnostic about the whole question about whether the new world and Asia are connected. That agnosticism comes from the fact that these maps are, de are derived from nautical charts and you never wanna speculate on a nautical chart. Nautical charts tend to be more rig rigorously empirical than geographical maps. So here the map is agnostic about whether the new world and Asia are connected, but note that we have that figure of that king. That's the Khan, the great Khan from Marco Polo. The text below it is Marco Polo's description of the island of Sipangu, the island itself appears right below it. And you'll see how in the materiality of the map, these three elements seem to mediate between a so-called American space on the right and an Asian space on the, uh, on the left to facilitate um, um, the imagination of the, to, to help the reader imagine that these places are either continuous or connected in some sort of way. So even as America gets invented over the course of the 16th century, the concept of the Indies gets remade and remolded to assure different kinds of connectivity, uh, even as geographical separation uh, gets uh, to be more and more recognized. The, the culmination of the story is this map 
by uh, Antonio de Herrera, who writes the, um, the major official history of Spanish imperialism, published for the first time in 1601, you'll see here that we have the two lines, the line cutting through the Atlantic, separating the Portuguese world from the Castilian world, and its counterpart in Asia that cuts through a longitude very close to the city of Malacca. Um, the Spaniards are willing to concede Malacca to the Portuguese, but everything east of Malacca, China, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, New Guinea, most of Indonesia, all of that is supposedly Spanish territory. What is happening by this point of the 16th century, and this is just to give you an idea of, of how the story changes. In the early maps, we saw that America was imagined as part of Asia, Mexico as sort of the front door of China. In this map, what's, being, what's happening is that the valence is reversed. By this time, we have established Spanish American colonies in the Americas. And here, East and Southeast Asia are being imagined as what the Spanish call the Indies of the West or the Indies of the setting sun as a Western frontier of Spanish imperialism in which places like China or the Philippines are often understood um, as filtered through the model of American indigenous empires or through the model of the Spanish experience in the Americas. So there's the concept of the Indies. Um, this is the way the official geography of the Spanish empire uh, works at the turn of the 16th century. There is no America and Asia, but rather the Indies of the South, the Indies of the North, and that frontier region, the Indies of the West. Okay, so this is very, very sketchy and very quickly the kind of history of geopolitical thinking that is at the heart of my argument. Each of the different chapters examines a different text or a set of texts that does the work of reimagining connectivity in the light of new discoveries and changes in geographical uh, knowledge and other forms of knowledge as well. And so just to give you an idea of what these are like, I'm gonna talk about uh, the book that appears in my last chapter, uh, The Conquest of the Molucas by Bartolomé Leonardo de Argensola. In a different version of this talk, I talk about China here, but because this is a center for Southeast Asian studies, then I absolutely had to switch to this book. And I was happy to do so because it's actually my favorite of all the texts that I read. This is a very strange book. Why is it written? It's written because in 1606, the Dutch have kicked the Iberians out of the Spice Islands, seizing the key islands of Ternate and Tidore. At this point, Portugal has been annexed by Spain. So these old controversies between Spain and Portugal about you know, where the border lies between their empires, they've sort of been, they've become problems that are internal to the Hispanic monarchy. They haven't gone away, but they're certainly not as, uh, as problematic as they had been before. So what does the King of Spain decide to do? He says he, he decides he wants to retake this bite silence. He wants to drive the Dutch out. But instead of organizing a Portuguese expedition that sails from Goa or Malacca, he organizes a Castilian expedition that sails from Manila. The expedition is successful. They, they throw the Dutch out and they establish a Spanish presence uh, on the islands of Tidore and Ternate that lasts for another 40 years or so. Um, and of course, the king's Portuguese subjects are outraged. They think that the king has given over to the Spaniards territory that should have been theirs, but the king is not listening. Um, instead, one of his officials hires this priest, Bartolomé Leonardo de Argensola, to write a history of this dramatic campaign. And what Argensola does is, is something rather different. Instead of just writing about that campaign, he decides to write a global history of insular Southeast Asia throughout the course of the 16th century. In other words, this is a book about um, the Moluccas in a global setting from the first European contact in the early de decades of the 16th century through this 1606 expedition. Uh, it has a variety of themes. Um, it's a very anti-Portuguese book and it talks about the failure of the Portuguese to really steward their empire. Uh, it talks about the Protestant contagion. In other words, when I say that it puts the Moluccas in a global context, is it, it's putting in a, in a global context, which is really the context of 
uh, imperial rivalry among European powers. The Portuguese are out, the Dutch have come in, they've brought Protestantism and they're teaching uh, native peoples the wrong form of Christianity. Uh, it's a book that glorifies the Spanish project of kicking the Dutch out and picking up where the Portuguese have failed. So it's very much Spain to the rescue. And uh, it's also about the looming menace of China. Every book about, uh, everything I've read at least, by Spaniards about this region of the world is always gonna be about two places. Whatever place is being talked about, even when they're talking about the Malukas, they're always talking about China because everyone recognizes that China is the major power in the region. And they're also always talking about the Philippines because the Philippines are the Spain's only colony. And so they are the foothold, they are the forward base, they are the place from which Spanish power is gonna be projected anywhere else. Now, to give you an idea of what Argensola does, is uh, there, I'm just gonna tell you about two episodes in the book, among all the many things, it's a long, complicated, convoluted history. For example, one of the things he talks about is uh, the incursion by Francis Drake, the man on the left, the famous English privateer. Francis Drake is the first non-Spaniard to penetrate the Pacific through the Strait of Magellan. He gets into the Pacific, he raids along the Spanish coast, winters in North America, crosses the Pacific, trades in the Spice Islands, and eventually makes it back to England circumnavigating the world. And it sounds an alarm for the Spanish. All of a sudden they have to defend this Pacific coast that had never been um, threatened by their European enemies. And they send this man, Pedro de Sarmiento de Gamboa, to seal the Strait of Magellan and to watch out for uh, the English. So we get this narrative, which is all about boundary making. It's all about establishing that the Strait of Magellan is a, is a privileged entrance into a Spanish space. We then get another story, a story about the first Dutch expedition to the East Indies, which pauses at the island of Mauritius. Uh, the Dutch were innovating with the use of Mauritius as a, as a way station for an innovative route across the Indian Ocean that would avoid uh, Habsburg shipping. Um, and uh, here we have no Spanish response. Instead, this is the alarm bell that tells the reader that Spain has to act to keep the Protestants out. And so how are the Indies being mapped in this book? The Indies are no longer the tropics. They're no longer the, the Spanish half of the world. They're actually the whole oceanic zone between the Strait of Magellan and the Cape of Good Hope. This is absolutely the most ambitious uh, version of the Habsburg Indies in all of um, uh, the period that I study. But by way of conclusion, when is this published? 1609. 1609, uh, a turning point in the history of Spanish imperialism because it's the point where the Spanish are forced to sign a peace treaty with the rebellious Dutch in effect, making a de facto recognition of Dutch independence. In other words, the book that most glorifies Spain's presence in the Indies of the West and speaks of an ever ex the possibilities of an ever expanding Christian empire is published in the same year when all those, all those ambitions have come to naught. Eventually, this way of thinking of the world doesn't take hold. None of us, you know, unless you live on the western border of North America, people in Vancouver uh, or in Los Angeles are often think of East Asia as lying to the west. They think in trans-Pacific terms. But unless you live in that part of the world, you're less likely to do that. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about a way of imagining the world that was not successful in its day, that failed along with Spanish efforts to exert hegemony over the Indies of the West. What is the value of looking at this? I would suggest that my book is something like the map that you're looking at right now by Joaquin Torres Garcia, or like any of these maps that many of us have seen that put South at the top or Australia in the center. They remind us how very malleable global geography is. They remind us that the globe or maps of the world, which so often seem natural and obvious, are actually products of historical contingency. And that had history worked another way, the map of the world would also be different. And I think what we discover by looking at the Indies of the setting sun is the tremendous plasticity of the world, at least in the European imagination, during the period of discoveries and exploration in the 16th century.
And with that, I'll conclude. I'll thank you for your attention and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Ricardo Padron for that very illuminating talk and that very fascinating presentation about how uh, the concept of the Indies uh, has changed over time and what it means to rethink uh, like our conception of the world right now in terms of using a historical concepts such as less, less Indias and in America. So uh, we're going to open the floor to your questions or your comments. Please uh, type them down uh, using the um, Q&A button that you have at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I think uh, Professor Padron would like to know that there are about 120 attendees to this uh, conference, which is quite uh, encouraging. Uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for everyone for, for your presence here. Um, we have uh, a question now from Victor Sierra Matute, uh, visiting assistant professor uh, at New York University. And he was saying, um, thank you for your beautiful lecture and your amazing and inno innovative research, Ricardo. Always a pleasure. My question is quite broad and related to a comment at the beginning of your talk. Why Hispanic studies have traditionally turned their back to a trans-Pacific approach? What's your theory and how the trans-Pacific approach is resh uh, reshaping Hispanic studies? I look forward to reading your book. Um, I think uh, this is a suspicion. It's not something that I've uh, delved into in great detail. Um, hello, Victor, nice to see you. Um, and also before I answer, let me say if people do not get a chance to ask either because we don't have time or because you're watching the recording, uh, feel free to email me at my UVA address and we can correspond um, about whatever's on your mind. Um, so I think it has to do with the fact that literary and cultural studies have their roots in 19th century nationalism, right? And so when the canons of uh, uh, Spanish and Latin American studies are being created, uh, no one, uh, there, th there is no independent Spanish speaking nation state in Southeast Asia because the Philippines are still a colony. And of course, when um, Spain loses control of the Philippines, um, it passes into American hands and English is imposed in a very dramatic and often violent way. Uh, so what we have here is we have a body of texts that never had a nation state to claim it as their literary past. And because of that, they get left out of these early processes of canonization that we then inherit. Um, so that's why I think it's important, you know, especially for those of us who work on periods, you know, from before the modern nation state, to think very broadly about the geographies um, that uh, might have been at work in that period and how they may be different from the geographies that inform our discipline. I like to think that my book is not just about the geography of uh, the geographical imagination of the early modern Hispanic world. It's also about the geographical imagination of early modern studies today and of Hispanic studies today. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any like mechanism for uh, a follow-up, but I'm hoping that uh, Victor would be, be able to confer with you personally uh, on another occasion, uh, Professor Padron. Uh, we have uh, a question here from, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Javari Abasi, uh, an Enfield uh, Spanish student from the University of Oxford. Uh, and they're saying um, you have talked a lot about how European slash Spanish meta geography is changed through the encounter with the East Indies or Indies. Do you think that the exchange of knowledge happened the other way as well? Did cosmovisions from the East uh, Indies challenge Spanish or European conceptions of the world? Uh, that could be. Um... Uh, it doesn't happen at the level at which I'm looking at, you know, I think at the level of official historiography and cartography, there's a lot of resistance, you know, you can incorporate um, non-European knowledge, but not, but there are limits to what can be done there. Um, one of the limitations of my book, um, it's very much a top-down approach, and it's very much about the European imagination. Um, and this was because, you know, to do this right, you either need a team of people or you need someone who's an absolute polyglot, which I am not, um, you know, that you could imagine a different version of my book written by someone who knows Mandarin, Japanese, Tagalog, Malay, Nahua, and Quechua. That would be a really great book. 
but um, so, you know, I recognize that it's top down. I recognize that it doesn't look at knowledge flow in the other direction. Um, but, uh, you know, I actually admit this in the introduction and I put my book that there is an invitation for people to respond with that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of questions coming in right now. Uh, well, uh, I have this from Luis Castelvi. Hola, Luis, from uh, the University of Manchester. Uh, you mentioned the Chinese menace as a late motif in Argensola and other chroniclers. Is there any xenophobic essentialism or proto-racism against the Chinese in this early modern corpus? Uh, the thing that we have to remember about the Chinese in the early modern period is that um, they are white. Um, and that's precisely why they're uh, dangerous. In other words, the implication of climate thinking is that the Chinese and the Japanese live in climates that are just as amenable to civilized life as Europe is. And so uh, there's really no difficulty in recognizing the Chinese and the Japanese as fully civilized people who simply lack Christianity. Um, uh, the racialization of the Chinese and the Japanese doesn't take place until the late 17th um, and the early 18th century. And other people have done work on this, you know, on the process of how they become yellow. And it's once the Chinese and the Japanese are yellowed that you can start talking about a racialized concept of Asia and of an Orientalism of the sort that Said describes. Uh, but I think we're looking at something very different. Uh, now, having said that, there is a tendency in Spanish thought to, you know, despite the fact that they recognize that the Chinese live in a temperate zone and are civilized, to understand the Chinese sort of as versions of servile tropical people who are subject to a tyrannical regime. And this is very important because there are all the proposals to conquer China. And all those proposals are rooted in the idea that the Chinese will greet the Spanish as liberators and you know, the Chinese empire will fall apart. This is what would allow Spain to conquer China given its limited resources uh, in relation to the scale of the country. So having said that in general, the Chinese are not racialized. I will say that there are threads of xenophobia that speak of something like racialization. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an interesting question uh, from Miguel Martinez of the University of Chicago. Hola, Miguel. What is the role of the Philippines specifically in this history of geopolitical thinking? I'm oh, thinking uh, of an area of Philippine colonial discourse that emphasizes the centrality of Manila in a newly imagined world. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, uh, Gunder Frank who says that, you know, for Emmanuel Wallerstein, the Philippines is the periphery of a periphery of a world system. Uh, once we put China in the center of the early modern world system, all of a sudden Manila becomes, it ceases being a periphery and starts to become extremely central because it becomes the point of entry of the Atlantic economy into a Chinese economy. And I actually think that's how it, what it looks like in Argensola, although it's not a point of entry, but rather a forward base a forward base for Christianity, a forward base for uh, Spanish military activity, for the projection of Spanish power. Uh, so what happens in my book is I actually don't deal with books that get down into the nitty gritty of Philippine worlds. The books that I was interested in were the ones that treat the Philippines as a strategic node in a larger space. You know, I was always interested in books working on this sort of very large geopolitical scale. Um, and so for example, in, in Argensola, the Philippines are actually crucial. And in a way, what the book is doing is it's charting the mobile, the global movement of, imperial, of Iberian imperialism. It begins with Portuguese expansion eastward, charts the failure of that movement, and then picks up with, wet, uh, with uh, Spanish expansion westward, westward towards the Philippines, westward toward the, uh, the, toward the Spice Islands, westwards towards China, and in effect reverses the valence of that kind of global imperial. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, uh, of things to unpack there. Um, we have, uh, I think we have time for a couple questions more. I hope uh, there are questions from people in Asian studies. I think most of the people asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have this one from Leor Payano. Um, my question is about the parallels between the Sangle, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the Chinese living in the Philippines and the indigenous people from Mexico and Peru. What are the parallels between these two ethnicities that we find in the Spanish imaginary? Um, hmm. 
You know, I, that's a difficult question, I think, to answer because um, I do think in the Spanish imaginary, it makes a difference if you're talking about sangles as opposed to Chinese in China. So the sangles are often looked at in very pejorative in terms while the Chinese can be admired. Um, by the same token, uh, indigenous peoples in the Americas, it kind of depends on whether we're talking about pre-Hispanic empires or you know, the Indians of the late 16th century. Um, it's very common in European discourse about indigenous people to idealize the ones that are dead and gone and look down upon their descendants in the colonial world. Um, and so I, I would think you'd have to map out questions of when, who is talking, so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally, one last question. I'm afraid I will not be able to ask all your questions. All of them are good, very interesting. Uh, but one last question from Sean Callahan, uh, Callanan, uh, an alumni of the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you for your fascinating talk. Uh, uh, in your work, have you found that India is also a shorthand for colony and that various European powers felt the need to have their own Indies? Yeah, in, in, in Spanish, it does matter whether you're using the plural or not, because India in the singular refers to what we think of as India, whereas Indies is this very flexible concept that is, it, it almost means the lands out there that are available for, con, uh, for colonization. And it's often mixed up with questions of insularity, even when you're talking about contents, uh, about continental places, they're insular ideas that get imported in a variety of ways. Uh, and yeah, Indies could be uh, a shorthand for a, a possession or a place that can be possessed or that is worth possessing, both because of the servility of its population, but also because of the richness of its desirable commodities. You know, the same climatic effects that supposedly make people servile also produce golden spices. So that's why the Indies are so interesting. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Ricardo Padron for this very fascinating, very illuminating talk, which we hope will be the first of many talks and many conversations that we have, that we will organize between Southeast Asian studies and Hispanic studies. 